Hello, you are very welcome to episode 168 of the Game Pit Podcast, a podcast about modern board gaming and a very proud member of the Dice Tower Network. My name's Ronan and this is just me this time around and hi, it's been a minute, almost two months since our last episode with Matthew. God, that's been a that's been a long two months. The one thing that hasn't been happening is gaming, really, to be honest. There's been some travelling. I've been over to Ireland for a couple of weeks to see my mother and also to visit Puria, who's moved there. You may remember once off this parish. And I've had a few long shifts to be dealing with and some stuff at work. And really, gaming just has not been happening in at least the last six weeks. Well, bits and bobs, but not really enough to put terror one of our current reviews with lots of games and lots of opinions so we've been kind of putting off and delaying and wondering where we're going to come from with the next episode so i have played some games mostly um ellie daughter has gone away to york university and we were finishing my city campaign that i've been talking about all year we finished all 24 games fabulous game certainly kept up the standards that i was raving about and probably improved on them so highly recommended also i did get to stay with puria for a night in ireland we played eight games of jaws of the lion which was fantastic that's now on hold hoping to get back to ireland again in january so hoping to pick that up from there and binge it a bit more i've also been playing some solo games because i've been traveling because i've been on night shifts and stuff like that i'm hoping the hot and heels of this episode there's going to be a top 10 from Sean and I. He's decided we're doing most overrated games. Hoping to get that out to you. But also I've got six solo games I'm going to rank and put out as well in a short episode. So one of those two will be coming next. But outside of those that have been sort of coming together, also I just spent the last weekend at LobsterCon 21. Now LobsterCon, as you might know, is from London on board, LOB, and people who go to London on board are called lobsters, kind of works, right? And twice a year since 2010, we have been heading down to Eastbourne on the south coast of England and taking over a hotel for some length of time. It depends, it varies. This time around, there was much discussion about whether to hold LobsterCon or not. I'm no longer one of the organisers. It's one of the things that, as well as not getting any gaming done, also with the uh, the new role at work, there's a lot of things outside of work that I used to be able to do in my old role. Now I'm just too busy and too much brain power goes in and I really had to pull back on the other things I do. So anyway, uh, not one of the organisers, but the discussion was going on and I'm aware of it and whether to hold LobsterCon or not and what format it would take. And a huge thanks to Chris Marling, designer and our guest on here and alex for all your hard work in getting it going it was at reduced capacity it was our our old home the cumberland hotel and i was because of the late notice i was able to get down there for really like a day and a half of gaming so i certainly wasn't there for the whole thing it would have been nice i was pretty tired i finished nights so i was all a bit messed up so i probably wasn't the best company for anyone who may have seen me there but i was trying and anyway we did get a few games played so i thought For this episode, I will just run through some of the games I played over the course of that weekend, give you some quick opinions. These aren't huge reviews. There's going to be some games I've played before. There's some games I've played for the first time. And just, you know what it's like when people give you a con report. I'll I'll let you know as we go how how many times I've played them or whatever or or what my experience with the games are. And some of them you're going to recognise anyway. You're going to go, oh, that old chestnut running and you're talking about that game for the hundredth time. Okay, let's kick in. The first game I'm going to talk about is called K3. It's designed by Philip Pru. It's published by Helvetique. And it's a wooden block game whereby there's various colours of these octagonal blocks. And you're going to lay out nine. And they form what's called the base camp, if you like. Because you're going to be building up a pyramid in the middle of the table, which is the mountain. But really, it's an abstract game within itself. Each player is going to be given between 19 and 10 blocks depending upon how many players you have it's between two to four and then you are going to build your own secretly little pyramid of blocks and the reason you're doing this is on your turn you're going to add one of your blocks to the base camp and it's going to build up however there are rules as to what colors can go and what colors and how you put them on so you're planning beforehand or hoping to plan where you're going to put together your blocks to make sure you get be able to play basically if someone can't play they're out and then therefore you move on from there so you try to put a coherent plan together so when you're placing your blocks onto the mountain in the middle 
your block has to go on at least one block of the same color and if you put it on just one block of the same color that's fine and you move on to the next player if you put it onto two blocks the same so let's say i put a blue on top of two blues another player actually gets to take one of mine but they don't put it on their pyramid they put it off to one side because the fact that you've built a pyramid means obviously you're limited in what blocks you can use you can only ever use the ones that are available with no other blocks on top of them the ability for a player to take one of yours and and keep it available to them off to the side gives them much more flexibility so you're trying to avoid putting yours on top of two of the same color there are also natural color blocks and they count as any color at all so they can get you out of a hole when you use them however it means that the other players have got an easier place to play and you sort of it's like resetting the colors a little bit and there's also white blocks which you build into your own your own little pyramid and when you take them out and put them to one side they don't get added to anything it's like passing it's like saying okay this is the point in which i don't want to play because maybe the other players have sort of built themselves into a corner over there and you, you want to step out or maybe you just can't play and those white ones give you that chance but you have very very few of them they're very limited in the game so k3 what's the appeal to it you can teach anyone it is an abstract it's got that that 3d sort of thing to it where you're building up which everyone sort of naturally takes to and it really doesn't take long to teach and i think after one game people start thinking and going oh and then there's a little thought of how to plan my own pyramid but it is very simple there's not a lot to it it's not strategic it's a little bit of take that you can see how it goes the more players there are the harder it is to plan your own pyramid and the smaller your pyramid is and the more you feel like you're cut off in the arms of how the game goes and where people choose to build because quite often they've got a choice of building to one side which will block one other player or to the other side which will block another player and you kind of have to be aware of what's going on or just play it and have a laugh because really what i think of k3 is that it's like a pub game having a pint having a chat, putting the blocks on top of each other, having the shared experience, having that something physical to do. The fact that you're building these blocks, people will come over and have a chat and say, oh, what's this, what you're doing? You can chat to them. I can really see it being at home in that sort of 10 minute sort of a, yeah, let's knock this out while we chat and have a laugh. It's certainly not a game to build a game night round. It's just a filler, but it's a fun filler with a bit of physical appeal. So K3, it's nice, it's simple, it's quick, it's not very demanding. Okay, the next game we played would be Legendary Buffy. This is the Legendary card game system from Upper Deck Entertainment. This particular one, Buffy, designed by Nick Little and Travis Chance. And it's themed around, as you know, legendary, all different themes. This one is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. This is the reason that the encounter system was brought into legendary. Because with that encounter system, the game is much more structured. And you play through chapters and you have particular setups and enemies come out. Now, not, it's not completely set up how it works, but it, it's much less random than the base legendary system in which you just throw some things in and you see it come, how it comes out in the wash. Legendary Buffy is a mess. You've still got the thing with the good guys that you put together. You know, you've got Buffy and Willow and Xander and Giles and all the rest of them. And... They are just too disparate, their powers. They just do not go together. They don't work together. The extreme powers are very extreme, but very hard to trigger on the more expensive cards because all the other ones aren't helping you work towards what you're trying to do. And it's like you're going down completely different routes and the cards you draw, if you draw out three cards and three different good guys and the Scooby gang or whatever, it just don't work together it's just frustrating and the bad guys it's very very random the way they come out if you get some easy ones earlier you're starting to roll and you're going if you get some of the tougher ones earlier you're in a big hole this one just does not work at all the threat set level is um wildly varied this came out in 2017 it's not even like a hugely old game it's not like they hadn't learned legendary was an old system by then they had the encounter games out this should have been within the encounter system it's not it's a mess avoid buffy legendary no good at all right from there it will be no surprise to anyone to hear that we taught calico both of us taught it to different groups and various groups over the course of the weekend as far as i could see it was a hit with everyone apart from the aforementioned alex much love to alex at the moment but you're wrong about calico fabulous game had a really good time people were laughing and enjoying it and they had the usual thing of oh 
this is much thinker than I thought and the moaning and the screaming and the, oh, if I could just move that one tile and, oh, I forgot about scoring over there and I've messed it up by putting this here. It all pulls together nicely. I took a whooping, which is good to see. I was definitely not a top four playing game. I was the whipping boy all weekend, but I was quite happy for that. So Calico, another hit with that. Next game we got to was Journey to the Centre of the Earth, designed by Alberto Milan and from Looping Games. This is a flip and write in which you're going to play over a grid and you're going to flip over two cards and one is going to give you a column or row which you're going to fill out and the other one's going to tell you what you're going to fill out within that column or row and what you're trying to do is there are four entrances top right bottom or left each of the players has to join from a separate one of those entrances and then you draw a circle a square or a triangle in the other three in whatever order you like and it is important that everyone starts on a different entrance and kind of randomize where the other exits are because otherwise you'd all be doing the same thing and there's one little twist which is going to come up i'm going to refer back to when we come to a later game which is also it's a roll and write similar to flip and write using dice obviously whereby there is no variety in that start just this small amount of variety in the start of journey to the center of the earth really is one of the things that that makes the game if it wasn't there this game would be not very good at all but that variety works nicely but causes a bit of chaos and this is a game in which chaos we will come back to again and again and again. Anyway, what you're trying to do, you're trying to get in from your entrance. You must be able to draw a line which goes through symbols or not to the center of your grid and back out again to one of the entrances which is still open. How does that work? Well, there's a deck of coordinate cards. They tell you what row or column they're going to be marking off on this particular turn however when you get all the way through them you're going to flip over a card and it's going to tell you whether the triangle circle or square exit is now blocked and they will be different for players because you filled them in randomly yourself not knowing which one is going to be blocked first and that can completely hinder you if you're close to getting out the exit then you're suddenly like ah now i have to rearrange and there's not enough time in the game to fully rearrange everything but it's something you're aware of going into so you have to be slightly flexible in the way that you're creating your pattern within your own little grid. The second card is a symbol card. Now that's gonna give you the lines to draw, which basically shows you've gone in a certain direction through a grid. Now, it's very hard to progress logically. You're very, very, very unlikely to be able to start at the beginning and draw lines and draw a corner and draw a line, because it's a line or a corner that you're drawing, and build up from your entrance to the middle to the exit. You're getting rows and columns all over the place and you're just trying to make a viable way if you can join things up as well as lines you get on this second deck you also get symbols there are set collections of symbols but the good thing about symbols is that they work in four ways so the lines might be from up or down or left to right so you have to go that way through the square you filled them in but when you hit a symbol you can go anyway and you need that flexibility and also the symbols can't be orthogonally adjacent to each other so you're trying to work out how to sort of checkerboard symbols as allowed to by the coordinates to create a plan but also collecting the symbols because they're going to give you extra points at the end of the game for set collection if you can just get through them most of the symbols however when that symbol deck runs out you're going to have to drink water now you start with a couple of cans of water but water is another symbol and you're going to have to have connected where you come into to water not right at the beginning of the game but during the course of the game you'll have to so it kind of becomes desperate that you get connected to water and that it all works together and it, and it can be a bit of pressure and if that deck runs out and you haven't got enough water to drink you are eliminated so that's something to be aware of within the game that you can get player elimination it can't happen right at the beginning but it can happen with five or ten minutes to go in quite a short game okay as well as giving you the symbols and the lines and when it runs out you've got to drink water there are also three helpers available to everyone each sort of round if you like able to break the rules and sort of turn one of these straight lines or corners into a t-junction or allow you to sort of ignore the coordinate cards and stuff however within the symbol deck there are cards that when they flip over they cancel one of the three workers and the three workers get cancelled and until you have to drink water they don't get reset again so timing of when to use those special helpers can be important and maybe they get cancelled on the initial flip over and you've been waiting and waiting and waiting for a certain helper to get you out and it just gets cancelled on you straight away you're like i have to wait for a bit longer 
which is funny, but some people could find it frustrating. And you have to be aware that you're going to have to find where you are with this game because it is funny, but it is frustrating as well. And whether that sits with how you want to play your games. There's more to it, though. Within that symbol deck, there are also two cards which require you to pass your sheet to either to the left or to the right. And the player to left or right on the row or column that's been drawn, so it's not completely random, but they get to fill in and block out a space. And the way that the rows and columns are drawn can create more problems for certain players than for others. For example, in one of my games, I was the player who came in at the bottom and a lot of the blocking cards came when the bottom rows were the coordinate card that was in play, meaning that a lot of blocking was done down the bottom of the map, which didn't really affect the other players because one of the players had gone from the top or left to right, obviously. And, and there was no chance of me doing well in that game. Now, I don't think I played very well anyway. Like I said, all weekend I didn't play well, but that was fine. But this is things that you must be aware of. The game is not particularly fair. It's going to hit you and it's going to hit you sort of randomly and you might nearly be out and suddenly oh i'm nearly out the triangle and then the triangle is the one that gets blocked with the rock fall and now you turn around and go well, i'm nowhere near the other two exits and suddenly from being in the, the lead you know in, in quote marks you're no longer in the lead it does feel tough now what do you want from a game because if what you're looking for is balance and strategy and planning something out and a culmination of a perfect plan fairness even journey to the center of the earth not the game for you that is not what's offered in here what you will get is discussion abusing each other a lot of groaning and a f- that feeling you get you know you play a hard co-op game and the game is constantly beating you up and you're sort of having a moan and you're like oh no and oh that's happened and that's a couple of my plans you have that feeling but in a competitive game because you're all sort of sympathising with each other. Because you're not, you are in the same boat, but you're not in the same boat. Because you're trying to do the same thing and you're drawing the same cards, but your own route is particular to yourself. So therefore, it's not direct competition, even though it is. This is a shocking description, but I hope you're getting what I'm trying to say. It's, it's a shared trial, and it pulls you together because you're all facing the same problems you're still trying to win <laughs> and you're not going to get particularly close scores of this i don't think ever because it is going to fall in together for some people and it's not for others and you can play badly but playing well is no guarantee of winning so there you go journey to the center of the earth it shouldn't work as well as it does but it does work quite well and i did have fun and i did ask to play it again and i saw people playing it again and again and listen to what i said because it's got the potential to absolutely frustrate you but it's got that potential to be a really sort of funny shared time as well where we're all sort of sighing and yeah okay that happened have a laugh move on right terraforming mars Ares expedition jacob Fuxelius, nick little again who did a legendary buffy and sydney engelstein it's terraforming mars meets race for the galaxy in that terraforming mars you are still building green cards and red cards which are events and blue cards which have actions or ongoing powers on them you are still generating income in exactly the same resources that you do in terraform and mars apart from you don't generate electricity although it's still within the game you do generate card draws though because that's no longer automatic you are still putting down cards which have symbols on them which allow you to play other cards that does include electricity though that's back in the game now there is still a map however it is much much simpler it is just a selection of the water tiles the ocean tiles which when you do do generate an ocean putting down from your card play then you flip over and get a very small bonus from doing that the other slight difference in the resources that the metal resources are no longer tracked by cubes but all the others are they're just an income if you like in metal and they give you sort of a permanent discount you can't build them up but they're there for whenever you want to play a space card or a building card to give you those discounts you'd expect from terraforming mars now in order to play the actual game to get these cards into play to do all the things that are very familiar with terraforming mars everyone is going to be selecting one of five actions secretly and then everyone puts their action card down and when everyone's ready you flip them over and only the actions which are selected are going to take place this turn there is your race for the galaxy what are the five actions though the first action is that everyone can play a green card 
if they wish to. If you've chosen the actual action, you get a bonus on all of these. It, it's just like you might be able to play an extra card, or you might get a discount or whatever, you might get extra money, whatever it is, you're going to get a bonus if you've chosen this particular action phase. The second one is you get to play a blue or a red card. The third one is that you get to take actions. Now, those are actions on your blue cards, but also that's how you're going to be able to convert heat into a temperature rise for Mars and plants into oxygen rise for Mars because it's the same terraforming rating. Your rating is the base of your income. You need to push up oxygen and get oceans and push up temperature. It's all exactly the same things as terraforming Mars in order to push up terraforming rating and score points and get more income. Those are all the same. The fourth action is to produce basically whereby you're going to get all your income in money in cards in plants and heat etc 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 and the fifth action is research in which you're going to be able to draw cards and keep a certain amount depending upon re what research powers you have and if we were to call research explore i don't think anyone would really notice the difference because this game owes a lot to race for the galaxy probably tom layman's name should be in that list of designers because there is a huge huge similarity between those five actions that are available to you and the five actions from race for the galaxy and there is a big similarity in that you're putting together card combos now in Ares Expedition, you're going to play way, way, way more cards than you are in race for the galaxy it's going to go on for much longer than race for the galaxy it has definitely got huge amounts of terraforming mars in there as well but it's very very reminiscent of race for the galaxy i mean these are the same five actions pretty much you can play two different types of cards with development and planet right you can look for cards okay that's explore that's research you can get your stuff or you can use your stuff okay anyway how does it relate to terraforming mars well it has got a smaller footprint i wouldn't say it has a small footprint but it's smaller than terraforming mars the play time, so we played a three-player game, took about 90 minutes to play. I would say that it's possible this could be played slightly quicker, and Terraforming Mars would usually take longer than that for three players to play. So there is a bit of difference. It's quicker than Terraforming Mars, but this its list is a 45 to 60 minute game. I'm no expert. That doesn't seem very likely to me from what I've seen so far, but there you go. It's definitely a possibility here to, if you wanted it to be quicker, to find a strategy and run the strategy. So you can have a few cards out and then just be smart and be like, this is all I need. I'm just going to absolutely smash these up and just run these actions, run these actions, run these actions. However, you need all three terraforming things to happen in order for the game to finish, same as a normal game of terraforming Mars. If, say, my strategy is to spam heat, if... Uh, the other people aren't particularly making oxygen and oceans happen quickly if they're taking a longer term view then my tight engine is not going to work as well in the long run as just the tm strategy of just putting out loads and loads and loads of cars and bumping up all your production and in the end but will just smash out tms but also points of cards slow play will win if everyone isn't trying to play quickly again my opinion on this i'm no expert part of that is because it's much lower scores in this we scored somewhere like low 40s i think would be the type, somewhere along those lines would be um points which is you know in terraforming mars you're talking way up but over, over 100 stuff like that which means that the cards that you play that have points on them have a much bigger impact because if I'm able to spam down a two-point card, a one-point card, a two-point card, three-point card, a one-point card, a two-point card, and I'm playing a longer strategy and just putting out these points cards, I will overwhelm someone who's tried to go for that quicker version. So, you know, the idea that this is a much quicker version, quicker isn't going to win you the game a lot of the time. There's definitely less downtime in this because everyone's choosing an action and you flip it over, then everyone can take the actions. That is a huge positive it does mean you're thinking a lot all the time. I did feel like it would be oh, a bit overwhelmed. There's a lot of cards. There's a lot going on. Because you're trying to keep track of everything on cards, it, so to me, sometimes it was hard to keep track of everything. It was less frustrating. There's always something to do. You, you're not having real sort of down times where, where there's nothing for you to do. You can always do something. You can always get your way out. You can always start rolling. There's, there's a, probably a better flow to this 
than there is a terraforming Mars. Whereas the there's the capability of terraforming Mars. If you have sort of a downtime or you're saving up for a couple of big cards and you're really doing nothing while other people are doing 16 actions towards the end of the game, that's not going to happen in Ares Expedition. It's good. I enjoyed it. But it is the love child of two fabulous, fabulous games. And I'm a little bit in the land of, well, the full terraforming Mars feels like a big epic game sort of thing where we, I can remember each separate game of it. And Race for the Galaxy, I can literally play in 20 minutes. And while this is a good game of itself, it's not short enough for me to say, oh yeah, I'd rather play this rather than full terraforming Mars. And also it's not different enough from either of them for me to say, I'd rather play it than either of those two. If I want a quick card game, I've got Race for the Galaxy. If I want a, a resource conversion thinky game, I've got Terraforming Mars. And this doesn't differentiate itself from the original game enough for me to say I particularly feel the need to have it. Would I say play it? Definitely, because it is a good game and I enjoyed it. I was just a bit surprised how much it was still similar to the original but stolen so much race from the galaxy. I don't know. Maybe I'm a little bit surprised about that. So I'm not. I'm not given the best thoughts. But I, I don't know why this one needed to exist. Okay. Next one was the crew mission deep sea. Thomas Singh and Cosmos, and it's the sequel to the crew, which I think you will hopefully know that I liked a lot. We played some five-player games of it everyone had played before and we had a fantastic time a few drinks had been had beforehand this was at the end of saturday night probably wasn't optimal play going on all the time but it within the difference basically of, of mission deep sea to the crew is that instead of having absolutely set missions every time you play and it's saying you need to do this you need to do this you need to do this it gives you a, a challenge rating and there's a challenge deck of cards and it's quite hefty and you pull out cards until you meet the challenge rating you've been given and flip them over so you get very 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 varied goals but there's still a logbook to tell you that oh but try and do it this way and try and do it that way so there's more variety in what you're trying to do which for that setting where we all knew the game was fantastic I would still say that if you're not that familiar with trick taking games or you want to get your head around this I'd actually go with the original because it's much more structured and it will much more bring you in. So if you're playing it with a family or people that know trick-taking games but maybe aren't that gamely, aren't used to sort of having the goals twisted on them and messed around, I would go with the original one just for that that ease in. Once, If you know the crew or if you're, you know, trick-taking or you're playing with gamers, then Mission Deep Sea just is endless, endless, endless variety. I, I don't think you'd ever... This is sort of automatically now on a desert island discs what five games would you bring well bring the crew mission deep so you're never ever ever going to run out of challenge in this game now it's fabulous in such a small box brilliant love it okay next one up was super skill pinball 4k from jeff engelstein and whiz kids and it's a roll and write pinball game which I had heard a lot about and was looking forward to trying. I saw it in the library and I thought, oh, it's just a quick roll and write. Let's grab this. I'll learn it quickly. Rachel was like, yeah, cool. We've got time to learn it. We're in no rush. Chris joined us and I'm like, right, let's give this a go because I'm excited. I've heard so many good things. So in the game, you roll two dice. You choose one per ball you've got in play. You start with one ball in play. There's a chance to get two. You choose one of the dice results and you use that and the board's constantly dropping down through your board it can bounce around the bumpers a bit if you, if you get the right rolls as it drops down you kind of choose the things it hits and you're marking off and when you mark off whole sets of things or every time you mark off you might score a point or if you mark off three or four in a set as it drops through that area so it will have to drop through once you mark off one of them drop through a second time drop, or drop, you mark off another one as long as you've got the correct dice rolls once the third one's marked off you might get a special power like getting your second ball, like extra scoring, like being able to bump different ways around the bumpers, whatever it might be. We played the base map. There's four maps within the game. This is the simplest powers that I'm talking about. There might be all sorts of, of trickery come in on the more difficult maps. Certainly there are pages of rules for the more difficult maps. So we'll see where that goes. Okay. You mark off combos, you mark off for points, and it recreates pinball, but really, really slow pinball imagine you started a pinball machine and for every bounce of a ball from you know, like a bumper to a bumper where it pings around 
each one of those bounces took 30 seconds because everyone's looking and everyone's in different places on their boards so you roll the dice and they go oh yeah okay so i might just be like going right that goes clockwise around my bumper i'll mark that off i'm done other people are like, mm, that combos with that, so I might put it that way. And that moves up there, and that doubles that, and that's double points there, so now I'm off four points. And then, mm, yeah, and maybe they've got a multiple, and they have to choose between the two of them. And they've got, oh, no, that one goes, uh, that, mark that off, then I'll get, I'll, I'll get a skill shot from there, and let me choose one number later. And then the one goes, and you're just sitting there going, okay, oh, I've put a dot in a star. 30 seconds. Yeah, okay, well, roll again. Oh, I, I bump off a bumper again. Dot. Yeah, okay. And then the next time around, you'll be further down the board. So you've got a little choice to make, and you're marking things off. And you're, how many points is that? 16 points. Like, dot, 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 dot. Because you've got to mark off each point individually on your board. While well, the other person's just had a bump, and they've gone, right, yeah, dot, bump. Okay. Really slow pinball. And it goes on for 45 minutes or more. And that rule book that I picked up saying, oh, it's just a quick roll and right. I'll just, it's got a quick start guide, which is utter nonsense. <laughs> you've got no, no chance of learning the game from that no chance of learning the game from the quick start guide get rid of that then you get the rule book and you're like what <laughs> you took that what is going on here it's so confusing and it doesn't even clarify some real basic basic stuff for you and then when you go through the confusing rule book you then get to each individual now, we played the easy map and I'm like there's all these extra rules for these things and I'm still not sure we played it right I'm genuinely not sure and it's really simple, and there's hardly any choices in the game, and it's fiddly as anything. And the ball is it's a hemisphere, it's a little metal hemisphere that you have to move around the place. There's no there's no places to move it. So you have to put it down where you're wiping off where you've marked on your board because there's nowhere else to pull it. And you're like, there's nowhere to put the ball. Well, they've made a pinball board with nowhere to put the ball I've got to move around. This doesn't make any sense. Oh... This was brutal. This was just brutal. There's nothing to separate strategies. There's no decisions to make, really. It's just very, very slowly move a ball around a board with nowhere to put the ball. And you're constantly scoring one or two. One, two points. Well, two points. Oh, I've got a combo. That's four points. One, and you're just constantly dotting, 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 dotting. And it's, this was absolutely painful. I cannot understand the positive reviews I've seen for super skill pinball 4k I genuinely cannot understand because no just big huge no okay let's get on to two games I know were great and enjoyed them very much I got to teach Embarcadero I got to teach June Imperium as well but I didn't get to actually play that because I had to go and teach Embarcadero, but I, I wish I had. I haven't played that for a little while, and I'm missing it. Okay, Embarcadero from Renegade, Adam Buckingham and Ed Marriott, the designers. It's over three rounds. I've reviewed it previously. You're going to end up playing 15 cards over those three rounds, and what you're doing is you're bringing ships into San Francisco Bay, and you're building buildings on top of them, and you're actually physically building building blocks and then putting little tiles on top to say that's what that building is and then building up building blocks again around wharfs and it looks fantastic and it plays fantastically and it's got a 3d aspect and it's got resource management and it's got adjacency rules for where you put your blocks you get little bonuses for being next to people but you want to be on your own on wharfs because they're going to score your points for sort of an, an area majority thing that's going on all the time and it's your build up your economy over the course of just a few cards looking to sink some of these ships in order to play the really big cards that score lots of points and the economy for money is really tight and there's a variety in how you score because there's different gold cards and people will be playing differently each time it's a fantastic strategy game it's got clean rules it's got very few actions that you actually take you're not doing 20 actions to get to one thing you're taking 15 actions over the course of the whole game but every single action is a real decision with real consequence you're fully working your brain out and you're not fighting the rules you're trying to play within the rules in order to play well the sort of game i love and renegade Put some back in behind Embarcadero. Support your game. Make it widely available. Push it. Because when you get this in front of gamers, medium weight gamers, Euro gamers are going to love this. I have never, ever had anyone who didn't enjoy Embarcadero with me. Get it out there. Play it. Find it, people. Fantastic game. 
Speaking of which, we were asked to teach Isle of Cats and we're very happy to do so. Frank West, City of Games, it is Perliomino. I heard them called Perliominoes. Anyway, tile laying, drafting, greatness. It was a hit again with the table. It's fabulous. I think it's even now slowly seeping through into people's minds that actually Isle of Cats is here to stick around. And is a, I see it going to the top 100 on BGG, a slow burner. I think it's just keep going and going and going. Waiting for the expansion. I loved it. So those two I played before. There's a new game to me. And it was So Clover by Francois Romain and Repos Games. It's a word game. Everyone gets given a clover, which has got a space for four cards in it. And you get four square cards, and these cards have got a word on each edge. You sort of spin them around however you like, and you put them down. You end up with four pairs of words now on the outside of the square you've made of cards. From those pairs of words, you write on the clover leaf adjacent to them a word that you think connects the two. So I got, for example, colourful and moustache, and I wrote lipstick or chocolate and book and i wrote charlie you're getting it okay from there you're going to take the four cards out which just leaves your clue words around the outside of your clover turn your clover face down shuffle up your cards add one or two or however many you want to the four cards you had how hard you want to make it then everyone is doing this at the same time you're all making your own four clues secretly and then we take turns flipping our clover over dealing out the cards we had which are clue cards we had plus some one or two red herrings and then everyone is trying to range the cards so that the two words that you were cluing are adjacent to the clue you gave and we had a really fun time playing it we ended up playing it 13 times over the course of a couple of days it's very very quick to play it's fun it's chatty you get in jokes going on people can be dirty if they want to or clean if they want to it's funny either way and there's no jeopardy in there so when you're guessing and you're and you're sort of going, you're doing it together, but also you're not going to hit an assassin card, like code names, because I think that's sort of the huge word game hit we always have to refer back to, which has good and bad because code names is tense and it's tight and it's oh and you're fighting again and I love that and it's got its own appeal. So Clover has got a similar appeal of making clever clues, but you only ever have to clue together two words and there's no real punishment. All you're trying to do is beat your own score. So all you're ever trying to do. So it is a more sort of chilled out, relaxed word cluing experience. But for that it is still very, very fun. I would say that this was the light game hit of the convention. Now, I didn't actually get to see those people and spend loads of time chatting, and I wasn't probably as social as I am usually at LobsterCon. And usually I can say that this one was a big hit and that one was a big hit. In terms of this LobsterCon, I can say So Clover was the light game hit that I was aware of. In terms of a heavier game that was a hit, there was a lot of variety in what was getting played, actually. Because it was the first LobsterCon for quite a while, I think that people wanted to do some old favourites, that they used to play in there. So Fury of Dracula came out and uh, Eldritch Horror was out and Zia and Sidereal Al Confidence. There were big games getting set up because this is a good place for doing that. In terms of newer hits, I think people talk about Imperial Steam, but also I would say from the people I spoke to that Iki, I-K-I, now I know it's a 2015 release in Japan, but, but now it's become widely available via So We Are French. That would be the, the sort of bigger if you like i know it's a massive deal but bigger game hit from who i spoke to at LobsterCon. so so clover and icky would would be the ones i'd say are coming out of there with most buzz so there you go that's that's pretty much all i got to play uh, like i say i didn't have ages to play games and i was yeah not quite on the ball and certainly I, I don't think i won anything but that's okay because i had a lovely time and some lovely food and some rest and it was all good and it was lovely to be by the sea and it was particularly lovely to see some faces i haven't seen in coming on a couple of years and there were lots of people who couldn't make it because it was only confirmed quite late and i certainly missed dozens and dozens of people who were always at lobster con and i did have a couple of moments of oh you know there are certain people i wish were there and I also had, though, great moments of appreciation and enjoyment for the hobby and for the people and for the friends I've made over many, many years going to London on board, over 10 years now. And I thought that, you know what, you get complacent about things in your life, 
surely over the last couple of years we've become less complacent about certain things and I need to make more effort to go and, and see people and do the things that I love to do including going and playing games so hopefully there'll be more games played and more reviews coming your way shortly apologies for the uh, for the long gap thank you for joining me for this episode we are proud members of the Dice Tower Network head to dicetower.com for all your gaming content if you want to get hold of us we are the Game Pit Podcast at gmail.com follow us on social media your best bet is Twitter really and that is just Game Pit Podcast thank you very much and we'll see you soon music by E. Aaron Lobster boy.